In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. These are familiar words that we find in the first chapters of Genesis, so familiar that I suspect all of us know immediately where they're from. This is the power of repetition and a good story. We know these words because we have heard them many times before. This is the story of creation, the story of a God creative and moving into and through God's own creation. Breathing life into the world, indeed into the universe itself. And humans are an essential part of this story with a starring role. As we heard in this reading of Scripture, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. These are the instructions given to Adam and Eve as the first humans in the Garden of Eden a place that was a perfect utopia. Everything had its place. Creation was in harmony. It was in balance, fully controlled and operated by God. It was a perfect system, ordered and functioning exactly as planned, deterministic, no unknown variables. This, of course, begs the question as to what kind of dominion Adam and Eve would have had in a garden when everything was in its right place and cared for, What does it mean to have dominion over a perfect system, to be caretakers and tending a perfect garden? But then, messed up. Adam and Eve disobeyed God and were forced to abandon this perfection, cast out of the garden. And yet, as humans created in the image of God, they possess tremendous power, power that only comes into full utility once they're no longer living in utopia. Fortunately, unfortunately, as a child, my only real experience with the first chapters of Genesis was to understand it as a technical explanation of creation, that the story could only be understood as the literal and scientific history of how the world came to be. But is that how the story was meant to be understood? Is that how the story would have been heard when it was told thousands of years ago? I doubt it. You see, when we peel back the layers, you find broad strokes and a much more epic tale, a story about humanity itself, about the evolution of humans, an opportunity to wrestle with deep truths of our trajectory as a species, not just a cute storybook tale about the first family. So let's start back at the beginning by understanding that the purpose of an origin and creation story is to tell those deep truths about who we are and where we have come from, not just a technical play-by-play of events. Today, science offers us the luxury of fossil records, scientific dating, and knowledge about evolutionary biology. This empirical evidence offers a technically accurate story about the history and evolutionary timeline on this planet. The story of Adam and Eve in a a larger context could be interpreted as a story about our emergence as a species, our human, our origins as humans. An interpretation about what makes us human, perhaps an explanation of what makes us different from the rest of creation that our ancestors could observe in the natural world around them. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, their eyes were opened, and they are forced out of the garden. One way of interpreting this story is that up to this point, they were in perfect lockstep with God, living in the garden, never disobeying God. Things were ordered, determined. They had never exerted their own free will until this moment. Perhaps it was not the actual eating of the fruit that changed them. It was the moment right before, the desire, the opportunity for disobedience for the first time. Their very first act outside the will of God, free will, 
agency to choose and determine their own path forward, a new way forward. And importantly, the ability to impact and influence the created world around them. In some ways, this was the first sin. The ability to enact freedom and choice when they had once been governed entirely by natural and ecological cycles. Perhaps this story is their interpretation of shedding the shackles of the animal kingdom for their next steps in advancing as a species, something that was always inevitable. For billions of years, there has been life on this earth, and before that, the ingredients for it. God breathed God's own self into all of creation. And the result of that energy, life, and movement has ultimately resulted in bearing the fruit of all life that we have today. Just as a pear tree makes pears, God's breathed earth has eventually made people. This journey of Adam and Eve out of the garden is in some ways the story of our own human journey away and apart from creation itself. No longer animals bound to the wild cycles of nature and ecosystems that were red in tooth and claw. The knowledge of good and evil separates humans from the puppet spring strings of creation. Our free will to express decisions, creativity, and even dominion over the world around us is when we left the utopia of the garden. It was the moment when we, as a species, were able to look back at God and declare, we got this, as we left the perfect garden. Left behind our animalistic dependence on nature and in some ways our purest relationship with the Creator. Next, in the story of Cain and Abel, their chosen occupations are not a coincidence. Abel, the shepherd, the nomad who moves with the flock, hunting and gathering, surviving off the land as he tends to the movements of his herd. Cain, the tiller of the ground, he is a farmer, able to stay in one place and work the land. Agriculture. The death of Abel, the nomad, at the hands of Cain, the farmer, is the anthropological story about the ongoing process of nomadic peoples settling down into agrarian societies. Just a few short verses later, we see all kinds of bronze and iron tools being created. Civilization. This origin story offers a deeper understanding about the trajectory of humanity, moving from foragers to hunters to farmers, but also underscores the essential relationship that we have with this planet. We have a deep responsibility to care for this earth. Not only because we should care deeply about the creative work of God, but because our very existence depends on the interdependence that we have developed over millions of years. We must begin to acknowledge the consequences of our free will and accept the responsibility that we took upon ourselves when we looked back at God and said, we got this. Do we? Have we come to understand the implications of our actions? Do we comprehend the consequences of our choices as a species? And perhaps most importantly, do we appreciate that the garden, all of God's breathed creation, is something that we are still a part of and deeply dependent upon? Can we reclaim the relationship that we once had? And will we use our free will to choose to do so? Because now, thousands of years after the origin stories were first told, things are really happening fast. Humans have managed to transform the earth more in just the last 50 years than in all previous generations that have come before. And a part of that challenge is that for most of us, we don't necessarily always see it. 
For much of advanced society, the very idea of living a good life necessarily implies not being burdened by the challenges of the natural world. Living comfortably in climate-controlled spaces with the ability to access clean water, food, and materials removes us from the front lines of encountering nature and relying upon it directly. Our success as a species, as most folks would define it, has been a result of our dominance and control of nature. Our ability to subdue the world around us and turn it into stuff. Look around you. Right, right now, go ahead. Look where you're sitting. What do you see that is real? What in this space is entirely natural? purely created by the hands of God and not man-made. Those plants in the back are not real. (laughs) But here, some life. Maybe that's it, though, in, in this room. Many things... Many times when I've asked this question about where we see pure creation around us, the most striking and poetic answer is actually in each other. As we move between synthetic climate-controlled bubbles, home to car to work to store to home, we humans are sometimes the only natural things in our own environments. We have lost touch with the natural world. I once heard this thought experiment about what it would be like to gather with all of your direct descendants. Imagine you're in a room and through the door walks your father or mother and then in walks their father or mother and then their parent and then their parent and then their parent, so on and so forth. Imagine that this goes on for 500 generations of a direct line of your ancestors coming into the room. What could you talk about? Assuming no challenges with linguistics. How could you relate to each other? The world has changed so quickly that aside from maybe the last three or four of your most recent relatives, there would be little everyday experiences to provide common ground. And yet your other 495 oldest ancestors would be able to share in many of their common experiences, almost all of which would revolve around a much more intimate agrarian relationship with interacting with the natural world or living in or off of the land. Most of us are not fully in tune with the seasonal changes of fauna and flora. Experiments have been done in which children today can easily name dozens and dozens of products and brands from seeing their logos, but are unable to identify even a single native plant species. I would expect this to be true for most adults as well. Most of us do not know what planets or constellations are in the sky tonight. The migratory patterns of animals, the nearest freshwater source of water, or about wild edible plants. We are far less connected to the earth And many of us have chosen or willingly accepted this path. And in this lapse of connection, we are participating in systems that are rapidly destroying life on this planet, faster and faster. Human populations are growing and consuming the natural world. As the lives of individuals around the world continue to improve, so does consumerism. If we seek to improve the life of all people, we must begin to reduce what we consume or develop more sustainable means of producing it. At current levels, if all the people of this earth consumed like Americans, we would need over three earths to meet that demand. A recent report from the World Wildlife Foundation has revealed that wild animal populations are in freefall, declining over 66% in just 50 years. There were many more wild animals in the world when any of us were born than in the world today. Their habitats are being destroyed to create pastures for beef, lush diverse rainforests are clear-cut 
to plant miles of palm, tree, palm oil trees, other habitats cleared for new building and development. Humans and our domesticated animals and livestock account for 96% of all mammals on this planet. Only 4% of mammals on earth today are wild creatures. This is happening now, and it is happening on our watch. Future generations will ask how we could let this happen. They will demand to know why we participated in the mass destruction of the planet. And they will have every right to ask that question. And our answers about, well, our own comfort and 401k plans and the fear of damaging the economy will probably ring hollow. But this is the choice that we are making. We stepped out of the garden and we said, we got this. I'm not convinced that the only solution here is to sell all of our possessions and move into the woods and try to live sustainably off the land, like as individual little um, plots. I'm not sure that our land could actually support that, Um, but we must figure out how to use our intelligence, imagination, technology, and creativity to develop solutions for sustainable systems. This includes things that we already know, eat less meat, understand the origin of our products, consume fewer fossil fuels, and seek to protect the environment. If we give nature the space to thrive, it will do so, and it can teach us. Our existence literally depends upon it. We need to look to God within creation around us. In our arrogance, we have forgotten that every single step along the way, God has been with us. The scriptures are filled with how we've repeatedly failed, failed to uphold our faith, broken covenants, broken relationships, and now even destroying the very creation that has sustained us for all of time. And yet, God is still here. God's love is the sustaining message for the how. God's creation is the example for learning ways to develop sustainable systems within that framework of love. We may not worship the earth as our God, but we can worship God through our care of the earth. For God is in all things. God in every atom of every cell of every beast, mountain, and flower. And when we seek to be in relationship, in deep connection with the world around us, we connect with God. And we can listen too. We must learn to listen better. Whether we like it or not, as humans, we have the ability to transform creation. We have dominion and authority, even if it was just by our given evolutionary status on this planet. With that power comes responsibility. And we have the opportunity, the choice, the free will to act as irresponsible consumers of the earth's resources or as mindful caretakers of them. We can return to being the gardeners that God had called us to be, but not merely as creatures without agency reacting to stimuli in a fixed system, but thoughtfully caring for creation by connecting with it, cultivating it. This past week, I was able to observe for the second time the most powerful and awe-inducing natural experience that I have ever encountered, total solar eclipse. It really is indescribable and something I feel every person deserves to see at least once in their lifetime. Our only two prominent heavenly bodies coming together in perfect alignment. The moon 400 times smaller but exactly 400 times closer than the sun making their apparent size exactly matched. A cosmic coincidence that is so rare 
that if aliens did exist, Earth would be a destination spot in the universe for observing such a unique celestial event. What are the chances? Well, here we are, living in a time and a place where we have been afforded the opportunity to live in a beautiful garden, the earth, the only such place that we know of in the universe. So as our own region of earth comes to life this spring, take in the fragrance of new blooms. Set our eyes upon the greens of new growth, the blue skies. Breathe in deeply the oxygen that sustains us. Doing so with appreciation is a prayer to God. But we show our deeper gratitude for creation, for our garden, by loving it and stewarding it forward for future generations. May we choose wisely.